Okay, well, I, I think we'll make a start now. I'll keep an eye out for anybody else who's um, needing to um, join us, but but it's after two now, so I think we'll uh, we'll, we'll get going. So uh, welcome everyone. I'm, my name is um, Suzanne Tatham. I'm Associate Director in the Library at the University of Sussex. So nice to see you um, today um, for this webinar. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. So we'll record the uh, presentations, but not the questions and discussions. Um, afterwards, but um, we'll make, make the recording available on the Mass Observation YouTube channel. So it'd be great if um, think about the questions that you, you, you'd you like to pose to our speakers and as we go along, and you can either put them in the chat or you can wait until the discussion at the end and then and then join us that way. So which, whichever way um, suits, suits you best. So I will just um, introduce our speakers uh, for today, and then they, then we'll, we'll we'll get going. So first of all, we'll have um, Kirsty Patrick, research manager, um, Jessica Scantlebury, archivist, and Angela Piccini, project archivist, and they're going to provide an introduction to Mass Observation's collection of narratives, diaries, and artwork generated throughout the COVID nineteen pandemic and their subsequent welcome-funded project, um, which was the Mass Observing COVID-19 project due to be completed this autumn. Um, and they'll be followed um, by Justine Robinson from the University of Sussex and Rhys Sando from the University of York. And they're going to share their linguistic analysis research using this uh, collection. So I'm gonna hand over now to Kirsty and hope that the, uh, the tech works. You. Yeah, indeed. Um, okay, bear with me. Sorry, we had a bit of a technical dilemma before you all came in. Some of you were struggling to get in, and so we just uh, got numerous screens open, so bear with me. Okay, can we all see that? Yeah, but it's it's not in presenter mode yeah. again. There we are. Yeah, but, uh, no, it's not. Um, oh, there enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just going to sit in here together. Okay. Welcome. It's lovely to see you all here today. Unfortunately, Angela Pacini is unable to join us today, but I wanted to keep her listed up here because um, she's heavily involved in doing all <laughs> our cataloging work. Leading on that, which Jessica is going to um, introduce you. All two. So today we're going to talk about the unique position mass observation is was in when the pandem pandemic started to unfold. We're going to be introducing the welcome funded project. Um, and as I said, the cataloging work that Angela has been doing an incredible job on. It's vast. Um, and Jessica will go through that. We want to talk about some of the challenges we've experienced through collecting and processing this material and highlight the potential research opportunities ultimately um, that this collection can offer for different disciplines. But first, I just wanted to briefly provide the context of which mass observation was in when um, enabling us to, to collect this valuable material. I know some of those on the call I recognise and are very familiar with Mass Observation, but just to uh, recap, Mass Observation was formed in 1937 as an independent social research organisation at a time of social and political unrest. With its founders having their roots in anthropology, sociology and documentary film, they sought to record the thoughts, opinions and everyday lived experiences of people across the UK. And this captured very much the social, political and personal aspects of their lives. And a key impetus for the founding at this time was George VI's coronation on the 12th of May, 1937. And the observations and diaries they generated from this day formed their first publication, May 12th. So working across the UK, they described mass observers as meteorological stations, which they hoped would enable them and other social scientists to compile a weather map of popular feeling. So using traditional survey techniques and observations by paid investigators, along with a national panel of self-selecting volunteer writers, they captured that which would otherwise go unrecorded or they intended might go unrecorded. The panel responded to open questionnaires known as directives and wrote regular diaries. And it provided an opportunity for people to share openly and candidly their thoughts and feelings made possible through their anonymity and a relationship of trust which was developed over the years. 
It remained active until the late 1950s, and in the 1970s, the material came into the care of the University of Sussex. And it was in 1981 that the panel side of mass observation was reignited, and that is what remains active today, with over 450 volunteers across the UK. So today, we continue to generate narrative material through this panel of volunteers known as mass observers, and they receive directives sent three times a year in spring, summer and autumn. And this image here shows a selection of the subjects that the mass observers have been tasked to write about over the years. We collaborate with different academic researchers across disciplines to come up with the themes and construct the questions. And we repeat many of the themes. So you can see um, a wide variety of here. We always cover political events. So we always cover general elections. We've got a lot on referendum, Brexit. Um, and each decade we ask about the NHS as well. So we, we come back and repeat and very much follow the interests of our founders. So we always ask about royal events as well. We'll touch on that later. The directives are composed in a way that enables anyone to respond respond it's really important that regardless of age or life experience um, we construct these in a way that people can respond very openly to in their own space and time so it's in very much encouraging their thoughts and experiences writing reflectively as i say in their own space unlike um, an interview and again it's the strength that this material offers is the depth in the richness of the narratives, which is which comes through a lot through this relationship of trust. Many have written for years, if not decades, and we've had a handful that are still writing since its inception in 1981. So it's very much a strong source for longitudinal research following individuals over time. And we've it's something that I've 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 talked about, you know, since since I started, but certainly I would say in the last four to five years, it's it's more significantly been used in that way. So today, mass observation is very much an archive of everyday life in Britain, used for uh, research, teaching, and wider learning. So we came from a place of contemporary collecting when COVID hit. We had a model for generating narratives of the lived experience with said anonymity and trust in place, yet we experienced challenges in the level of interest our calls generated. As we went into lockdown in March 2020, we started to receive inquiries from people wishing to participate and also from researchers very keen to ask what we would be doing, knowing that we would be out there collecting. So we had an actively engaged panel uh, with volunteers who we knew would have already started documenting events as we'd seen this with the death of Diana and the events surrounding 9-11. So although in March 2020, as we left the office, like everybody else, we had no idea how events would pan out. We hurriedly mailed out a special directive to our volunteers to just keep on writing. And detailed here is what we sent to our panel over the pandemic period. So as I said, we sent out the special issue in March 2020, a horrid letter just uh, telling people to write. And then by spring, we were able to send out a, a, a full directive. Now, our concern was that there's a proportion of our panel who received the directive by mail, and we weren't sure on a practical level where the printers would be open, but they were and my children hardly uh, stuffed envelopes as part of their homeschooling activity. And we managed to get uh, the directives out to everybody. So you can see here, we asked about the coronavirus in spring, in summer, it captured uh, in autumn and in spring 2021. But alongside that were other commissions um, relevant to that time. And so all of that falls into our COVID um, collection because it's touched upon within those subjects. Uh, so the other strand of approach for building uh, this collection of material is um, our open call for diaries more generally and this was then followed by our annual 
12th of May Day Diary. So at this point, we've been doing it for 10 years, and this is an opportunity where we ask people across the UK to document their day. Um, we use social media to publicise, and our engagement manager, who's on the call here today, Suzanne, reached out to her contacts. So this included groups and networks she'd previously been involved with, schools, older people's groups and prisons. And uh, as you can imagine, the 12th of May 2020, as Jessica will go into, just struck a chord at that point in time. We were in full lockdown. So we have responses from across the UK. Uh, the narratives and diaries capture the regional differences as the pandemic played out with different restrictions in geographical areas too. So I haven't got too much time to discuss the content, but I wanted to share a few quotes with you. Really, I just want to be by myself and cry, breathe. People are talking about this situation going on for months. We're on week two and it's already mental. It's a lot all the time. It's not going away. I keep crying. I can't sleep. The emotion is palpable as you read the narratives. They're incredibly powerful. I'm sure we've all had uh, moments like this that we could have related to. And the responses really show how people were navigating and making sense of events and the subsequent decisions. As we see here in this quote, decisions are being made seemingly on the hoof and lots of people feel confused by this. It feels as though they have to pull out a surprise at every briefing. So the whole collection has synergies with our wartime material. Um, and I mean that in its format, in its size, and the immediacy in which events were documented. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Jessica. Thank you. So I'm going to um, move on now to talk about what arrived at the archive, um, the challenges that we face, and then also introduce our current um, welcome project, which is a plan to um, disseminate some of some of this material. So um, we, we were completely um, overwhelmed with what arrived at the archive. As Kirsty's already said, um, we have an experience of contemporary collecting um, and um, uh, documenting things, things as they happen, um, but it, it really did strike a chord with uh, writers. And in the end, we received around 8,000 documents 5,000 of these were written in response to the 12th of May diary call, which Kirsty mentioned. Um, it it uh, got picked up uh, in the media, uh, social media, and it, and it just, um, I'm sure everyone felt like documenting something at that time. It just uh, really captured a mood. And to put that into context, so we received 5,000. We normally um, each year receive around 200, 250 documents. So it, it, it was um, a massive increase for us. And because of this, we recruited a new member of staff who worked with us for eight months cataloging the collection and help us uh, deal with the increased uh, response. And this in itself was a kind of challenge because uh, this member of staff was recruited and uh, working uh, completely during the kind of lockdown period. So some of our team actually didn't even get to meet her face to face. Everything that we were doing was remotely. Um, almost all of the narratives are in Word or PDF format file. Um, this is because as an archive, um, our mission is to uh, collect uh, narrative or textual documents, but we also collect uh, visual responses too. So there are photographs and drawings in there. There are also um, a few uh, audio files in there, which um, was a challenge for us because, uh, as I've said, we're a textual archive, so our experiences is dealing with text. Around 75% of the, of the files that we received were in electronic format, which was good for us because we were remote working at the time. So the challenge is definitely um, the scale of the writing. Um, we were, as I said, we were overwhelmed. Um, some of our observers kept diaries for um, over two years of the pandemic, and they would often send in multiple versions of the same document. So they might uh, write their diary up to June and then send in their next instalment, which actually uh, included their first instalment as well. So it took some um, unpicking for us to work out 
which version what was the complete um, version. We actually do keep everything that someone will send to us, but we'll we'll try and make an access uh, copy. Um, also, um, the responses were um, very candid. We're used to dealing with this, um, but they were perhaps more candid than other directive responses. And also uh, extremely, often extremely identifiable, particularly in the diaries. So where we were asking people to uh, record their daily routine, they might really go to town with this. So they might actually say, this is where I go for a run or at 12 o'clock on a Saturday. This is the postcode. This is the route that I do. So we had some uh, adjustment about trying to work out what um, put someone in a compromising uh, situation that compromised their identity, particularly um, as these documents may well be read within the first couple of months of them arriving at the archive. Um, and then in these cases, we um, made some decisions to redact material. Um, we do keep the original version, but we made some decisions to redact using Adobe uh, reduction process um, and do this on the access copy. But in some cases, we also took the decision to write to the mass observer in question to check that they were happy um, for this material to be um, accessed. And th this was just kind of helpful, helpful for us. I have to say the response was always yes. Um, I want this material to be read and go into the archive. But this was just kind of helpful for us to check our processes as well. Um, we also struggled uh, with uh, working remotely because some of our observers uh, don't uh, email responses in or, or send them to us electronically. Some of our writers are still um, uh, posting to uh, the archive, which during the lockdown period meant that we were uh, unable to uh, deal with that material as, as quickly as we'd like. We had to wait until we were allowed back in the building. And there was also um, an increased demand by uh, researchers, the media, and, and also the public. People were very keen to find out what we were doing and also use these documents as they were coming in. So because of that interest, we um, knew that we had to um, uh, do something that, with the material and, and make them more accessible for people. And for this reason, we uh, put in a bid to the Wellcome Trust um, for a 18 month project to uh, create an open access resource, which would contain the full narratives of 8,000 documents with um, full text searching and also um, uh, for them to be keyworded with subject uh, headings. Um, we have been working with a team of um, social scientists and people from the humanities and also um, a group of um, computer scientists based at the University of Southampton who work in a department called Geodata um, to create this resource. They're actually, we're actually extending a resource that Mass Observation already had. We call it the Mass Observation Project Database. And we are using this database and extending it to include uh, this material. As I said, this will be an open access resource and so we're working on it now and we're entering the final stages of the project and it's due to be launched uh, in autumn 2023. So, yeah, thank you. So this is uh, the work packages that were um, we've set up. So we've got four work packages. Actually, we have got five, um, the fifth one being disseminating the material. But the four work packages that we're in the middle of at the moment are preparing the data, uh, digitizing the paper responses, developing the database, and then working up plans to deliver the uh, textual content. Um, while we uh, prepare the data, um, as I've said, we're doing some work to um, redact anything identifiable, such as names, locations, or contact details that may be with, within the uh, narratives using Adobe's reduction tool. We're also working to augment um, the existing metadata that exists on the database that we already have. So the database we already have contains uh, data about people's um, uh, region, birth and gender. Um, and we are using a, um, some data that we captured dur during the pandemic 
to augment with uh, information about ethnicity, religion, and sexual orientation. And this is from a free text form that we developed um, during the pandemic. We've also been um, digitizing the paper responses. Um, and this, this work is complete, but we um, are working as well to develop some transcriptions of these uh, paper responses. And this is to enable the full text searching um, to make sure that they're on a par with their electronic uh, counterparts. I suspect that this, this takes a lot of time and I suspect that this will have a life after our project, but it's something that we're aiming to achieve. As I've said, the development of the database is being done by Geodata. We're currently uh, in a user testing phase at the moment. And this database includes um, document indexing and full touch um, searching. And then finally, the uh, delivering the textual content. So it will be possible on the database for anyone to uh, download the metadata in Excel format and then also download the full uh, textual narratives. But we're working with Geodata to um, see how we can extend this um, access of, of the data in terms of an API development. And they're working at the moment to come up with some plans for us to test. So I'm gonna move on now and share my screen. And my colleague, um, Angela, who unfortunately isn't with us today, is uh, the uh, project archivist or uh, cataloger. And she has um, developed some plans to catalog the material. I've got her notes, which I'm going to go through. I'm going to share my screen. So you can see her impressive spreadsheets. <sighs> Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Angela at the beginning of the project was actually a job share and she worked with a colleague, uh, Natasha, and they um, at the beginning of the project were <laughs> shown all this data and uh, told uh, to make some sense of it. Um, and I suppose that this is probably a bit of a chicken and egg approach because uh, to get a kind of full sense of the material, you need to uh, read some of it and have a kind of overarching uh, view of, of the material. You may also uh, look at other projects to see how they've been run. Um, and Angela and Natasha certainly did do this. Um, they found many projects. I'm sure we all heard of projects that happened during the uh, lockdown periods by other archives and museums community groups who put out a call for COVID related material. But when they started, much of this material um, hadn't been uh, catalogued. Um, and it was kind of too early for um, some of the uh, more professional institutions to have developed subject he headings um, specifically related to COVID-19. Um, so they were really uh, dealt the task of coming up with a controlled vo vocabulary to uh, use uh, to describe mass observation. I'm just going to scroll down a bit so you can um, see that they have some date ranges, some things that are very sp uh, specific to COVID. Um, so things like contact tracing, uh, disease, public information, it's funny, yeah. Yeah. Um, homeschooling, and then things that um, relate certainly to COVID-19, but may have kind of broader um, implications as well. Um, if anyone would like to see this list, and I appreciate that it's quite a lot of information to be given at once, we can certainly share that with you. Um, so they, they started looking at other institutions and um, initially were working with the HACCIT uh, thesaurus. So this is the humanities and social science electronic thesaurus and also the FAS thesaurus, the faceted application subject terminology, which is um, derived by the Library of Congress's subject headings. Uh, but they recognised that these terms um, weren't broad enough to capture everything related to COVID-19, so there needed to be uh, some bespoke terminology in there as well. And so they tried to uh, develop this um, these terminology and we hope that they'll be useful for other projects as well. Uh, they've kept their terms to around 100. So 
if I scroll right down to the end, because there's 97 of them. <laughs> I where, I double checked it when she when she said that. Um, and uh, they um, did some kind of spot checking at the beginning to um, to make sure that their terms would work with all our documents in there. So they want to avoid it being too uh, granular because this will come out in the full text searching as well. Um, so these uh, these terminologies were developed uh, primarily by Angela and Natasha, but also um, through feedback with the project team, particularly with the academics working on our project advisory board. So this is Kate Lester and Justina Robinson at the University of Sussex, and you'll hear from um, Justina uh, later. I'm going to stop sharing this and share another document. So this is uh, Angela's cataloging spreadsheet, and this is for some material related to our COVID and time directive. Um, so you can see uh, how the sort of work that she, oh, sorry, I can't, for some reason, oh yeah. Yeah, so so it was <laughs> uh, you can see the cataloging that she has been doing. So we've got um, very standard things that re relate to an archival catalog. So each uh, response will be given a file name. And this relates specifically to a mass observer. All our mass observers, rather than using their real name, are given a code. Um, you can see the collection title, what format it's in. Um, and whether it's uh, word process or handwritten, the date that it arrived at the archive, a brief description of, um, of the individual who wrote uh, this material, although this biographical information is also captured elsewhere in, in the data in a kind of more structured format, uh, a description of, of their response, and then a description uh, or thematic words relating to the actual directive question itself. And then finally, these keywords are used, the keywords that I uh, showed in the earlier um, spreadsheet are used to index um, the actual response. So as you can imagine, it's an enormous amount of work that Angela and uh, Natasha have undertaken and they are uh, getting through um, the responses, all 8,000 of them. Um, while they've been uh, developing um, these processes, they've also recognised the need for a, um, a glossary um, of responses. And this is in development at the moment. Um, Angela has been working with our um, uh, Chase intern, uh, Jacinta, who has uh, looked at some of the documents to develop a, a glossary, which we will be able to use on the database or provide access to, of terms and phrases that are particularly prevalent in the collection, but may well be forget forgotten as we've uh, as we move further away from the pandemic. Um, you know, I'm sure we oh well, per perhaps you did, but I didn't know the word furlough before the pandemic, and then it was everything was about furlough. So. Um, yeah, we're, we're trying to uh, capture some of those words that were really common. So things like eat, eat out to help out. Um, I'll scroll down a bit more. Yeah, it's good. Um, so many different ways of sorry, saying Boris Johnson. <laughs> uh, bubble, support bubble, house party. I don't remember at all, but apparently <laughs> was uh, really prevalent in our responses as being a social work, uh, social networking app. Um, that was a popular way that people could communicate with each other. Um, things like herd immunity, P with Joe Wicks, the R rate, um, loads of mentions of VE Day because that happened um, during the, in the pandemic. Tier system, yeah, lot, lots of uh, good work being done there to kind of capture these terms so that when researchers using them now, um, or in, in the future can um, try and find a place to, uh, to work out these responses. I'm going to leave it there, and I think we're handing over to Justina and Reese now. I'll stop okay. sharing my screen. Yeah, thanks very much, um, Kirsty and Jessica. That was great. Um, so, well, um, 
just uh, welcome uh, in Justina, getting her presentation. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can see that. You yeah. just... Can you hear me as well? Yeah, that's all clear. Um, if you just want to just put it into presentation mode, then we'll be ready to go, but we can hear you nice and clearly. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so presentation mode. Maybe. So, um, no. thank you so much for um, uh, for this um, really helpful um, and thorough introduction to uh, the archives. Uh, this really helps uh, help me out when doing my presentation because uh, all the grounds have been laid, and I can just tell you about how we've been playing with the data. So let me first introduce um, myself and my team and how we came to work with mass observation. So um, my name is Justina Robinson and I am a senior lecturer in English language and linguistics at the University of Sussex. And I am a lead of concept analytics lab together with Rhys, Sando, Julie, Becky, William, Yasir and Eddie. Uh, so all those uh, people uh, contributed in various ways to the work that I'm presenting today. Um, Sandra is standing up for Rhys uh, today in answering questions together with me. Um, uh, but the, 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 the work that I'm presenting is collective. Collective because uh, as a linguist, I uh, were, was not able to do all those interesting ways of exploring mass observation data that I wanted to do. So I needed help of uh, people working with computational linguistics and I uh, uh, and AI and um, also other areas of linguistics. So um, uh, we are together, as I said, working in concept analytics lab. And in this lab, we are interested in um, exploring, uh, uh, exploring language uh, with the purpose of extracting patterns of thinking um, that we um, um, refer to with the shortcut of a, of a concept. Um, and uh, we uh, have been working with mass observation archive for a while. When I joined University of Sussex, I very, very shortly after um, uh, found out about the KEEP and the mass observation, and I've been working with Kirsty and her team uh, on various kind of uses of mass observation data, including educational uses. Um, and, uh, um, um, and today, uh, I wanted to uh, talk about our um, exploration of uh, COVID-19 uh, collections, I'm going to focus on the diary data, uh, and uh, ways we've been reading the data as linguists, and some opportunities uh, um, we've, uh, we've capitalized upon, we captured, and some of the things that we want to do further uh, with regards to this um, rich uh, and very important um, um, collection. And this work has been... Um, uh, funded by all sorts of pots of money. Um, uh, that's why you see various logos at the bottom of that uh, slide. So let me get, uh, uh, get to the um, actual uh, um, purpose of our work here. So in Concept Analytics Lab, as I said, we are interested in exploring patterns of thinking. And with this specific COVID collection, we wanted to find out what are the changes in collective cognition and memory that affected us during COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it seemed like that was a time of a pause, reshuffling of some of the ways we've been living our lives. And we wanted to find out what were the different um, um, uh, concepts that would characterize that uh, COVID-19 life and in future kind of post-COVID-19 um, uh, thought restructuring. Um, 
So this was kind of our approach, but we also um, uh, dealt here with quite uh, with unprecedented uh, with unprecedented uh, amount of data. Um, this slide shows uh, how much more uh, uh, diaries we uh, have been uh, dealing with this year. So um, in May, when just in the May 2020, the 12th of May. A uh, diary project collected just short of 5,000 documents. And in the previous nine years of the data collection, we didn't even reach that amount. So we suddenly had a lot of data that couldn't have just been uh, read closely because there was simply too much of it. On average, we see each participant, each volunteer writing around 1,000 words. So um, um, just for May 2020, uh, uh, we've had um, uh, nearly uh, nearly five million words of analysis, and this is just too much for close reading. Um, uh, so this is where kind of computational tools and a bit uh, more automated way of reading texts uh, come in. Um, but how to read the text? Um, Sorry, I just need to move to the next, uh, the next um, slide. How to read the date? Um, as I said already, that the close reading um, requires either an awful amount of time or perhaps smaller data sets. With distant reading, so like reading for uh, looking for patterns, uh, reading data through the computer, uh, you need to know what to search for. And when we deal with um, collection that um, that was, um, sorry, my cat is distracting me. A collection that was um, uh, uh, that's embracing new time. What are the kind of keywords we need to be 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 searching for? In the previous, you've heard of the archivist. Uh, challenges uh, in cataloging the data because there are new ways of living and therefore new new terms for some of those ways of living. But there are some ways, some new concepts for which we didn't have words that we could just key in into the text. So the first question is, what shall we be looking looking out for? Um, uh, the other question is um, how to um, um, so what to search for, how to kind of how to key it in, what are the actual terms to key in. Uh, also, this, the, the next question is, if you find out patterns um, of uh, usage of a particular keyword, how do you know that those patterns are meaningful? Sometimes a word being fre frequent in a given text doesn't mean that it's particularly meaningful. It only becomes meaningful if you see that your reference data set doesn't have that word. So for instance, we use a lot of article, definite article the doesn't mean that this article is particularly meaningful or particularly unusual because we use it, we used it before and after COVID and we use it all the time. So we, we kind of needed to find solution to be able to read the May COVID collections um, against some kind of benchmark to find the meaningful patterns um, and um, another question, how do I use, how do I make sense of all the metadata that come with COVID collections? Uh, our volunteers share with us a lot of information through the narrative, but also uh, through sharing the bio data um, with many of the volunteers. This, this, we know that where they live, we know uh, the age, um, we know the, uh, the the profession and few other things. So how do I make sense of that data as well, together with all the previous data? So in today's presentation, uh, I'm going to address uh, 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 or show you how we've dealt with those questions. Can I just check that I should finish by three o'clock? Uh, yes, yeah, or soon after. Yeah, that would be That's great. Soon, soon after. Okay, so I've got my time here. Okay, so I'm going to take you through the journey. Some of the things that I may be going through will be um, quite quick, so I'm happy to uh, come back to those in um, in uh, um, question section. 
Um, so uh, most of you are familiar with uh, May the 12th Diaries, so which is the collection uh, of the COVID um, um, data set that I'm going to explore. So on the 12th of May of every day, people are asked to record everything they did from when they woke up in the morning to when they went to sleep at night. And um, one of the shorter diary uh, is this one. Uh, I'm sorry, there is so much uh, text on the slide, but this is also quite a neat diary. I'm just gonna quickly read you things. It's a diary from, from a child who was saying that he woke up at a given time, did some distance learning, played on the computer, went for a jog at three o'clock was bad, the back was hungry, so he ate played a bit with sister, with family, and went to bed. Kind of a story like that. What we notice is that uh, quite a few terms here um, uh, are repeated concepts. They might be expressed differently, but they are concepts, the same concepts that are just repeated several times. So for instance, this um, uh, diary says, I played around with a ball. Then he played a game of tag played fun online games, played with a ball. So there is the same concept of playing a game, um, either online game or a board game or a ball game, but there is a, we could agree that there is a shared concept of kind of um, a, a leisure activity that is a game. Then he mentions his family, says his dead mom, sister, my little sister and family again. So again, we have, the same concept of a relative expressed through different words. So in order to explore collections like that, we turned um, uh, all the writing into collections of concepts in order to be able to get to the key characteristic concepts in, a, in our data set. Um, because if we look just for individual words, although we also did that, but if you look for individual words, you might not get enough of the frequency for the given word to show you that there is anything special about what that word indicates. So uh, let me um, unpack that a bit. So let's take, we have a sentence, my dad, my mom, my sisters and I, Okay, so these are the tokens in the first column. My dad, my mom, sisters, and I. Then we um, we lemmatize that, so which means that we take the word to the very core form of the word. Nothing changes here apart from sister. There is kind of a sisters. It's in kind of the core form is sister. Uh, then we've put part of speech. So whether it's a personal pronoun, noun, um, plural noun, coordinating conjunction, and again, a pronoun. And then we used a tool called WordNet, which is a knowledge-based um, like semantic system, which assigns every single word to a given concept and in a hierarchy, to a hierarchy um, uh, of concepts. So, um, um, so this is the word net sense, and then association, so assignment of the word net sense to a given concept. So um, um, let's start with an example of dead. Uh, so the concept that word net um, uh, gave us is the concept of relative. Uh, although the sub concepts are different here, so it's ancestor, parent, father. Um, the mother comes also to the concept of relative, although the path is slightly different. It's ancestor, parent, and then mother. Uh, sister comes also to the concept of relative, uh, although the journey to that concept is slightly different. But by the and the same is with pronouns. Pronoun my and pronoun I are different uh, forms of first person pronouns. So again, um, we managed to um, transform the text of original data that had, if you look at the bottom of the slide, um, uh, the sentence, my mom, my dad, and my sisters, 
uh, used um, um, pronoun my three times, uh, used once word dad, once word mom, once word sister, and once those words. Now we kind of moved it to a data a format which uses um, four pronouns, uh, three times concept of relative, and one then coordinating conjunction. So that's what we, how we kind of first um, uh, transform the data. We transform it from a data set of words and sentences as we use them to data set of concepts um, um, so that we could find out significant concepts in the data, regardless of how those concepts are lexicalized, how they are expressed with language. So if during COVID times, any text, let's say, but this is a COVID text, if during COVID time, people talk especially a lot about the family, regardless whether they said mom, dad, sister, brother, we still will have the data, uh, we, we still will be able to get to the concept of family as being significantly frequent um, because we, um, we um, translated the text to the text of concepts rather than individual words that individually don't often have enough of the um, frequency, enough of the um, uh, you know, sufficient number for the software that relies on statistical patterns to pick up those terms, okay? So that was our kind of manipulation of the text to pick up the concepts rather than words. Uh, let me show you what, what was the outcome of uh, that exercise. Okay, my slide moves on. Okay, um, so um, we looked at the concepts in May collection. So this one, May 2020, and we used the nine previous years of uh, May diaries as our benchmark. So we really wanted to find out what are the concepts that are characteristic of May 2020 when we, uh, as opposed to or in compared to uh, nine previous days, uh, nine, pre nine previous years of writing about May the 12th. So, um, um, and we also then did the kind of reverse analysis. We wanted to see what is that people talked about nine years before COVID that they stopped talking about during COVID times. So we used those two corpora as a kind of benchmark for one another. Let me show you the results. This um, um, visualization shows the 100 concepts that were the most significant. I'm using a particular statistics here called PMI, pointwise mutual information. Again, if you'd like to ask me more about it in the questions, I will do that. But these are the 100 concepts that are most characteristic of the May 2020 in comparison to the nine previous years of um, May diary writing. And those concepts, um, many of them are kind of obvious to us having lived through uh, a pandemic. So the first one is lockdown, sore, pandemic, furlough, distance. Uh, again, furlough, there are slightly different meanings of that, mask, shield, a furlough again, pandemic, Zoom, shield, quarantine, etc., and this and, and it goes. But within um with this visualization, we have this kind of conceptual fingerprint of a given data set in here of May 2020. And we can do the same for every single year of the May diaries to see if the conceptual fingerprint of the data changes across time. And if so, how it changes, not only in terms of meaning, but also in terms of parts of speech. Uh, let me show you part of speech coding in different visualization. This is made on purpose. Uh, or the sh uh, not on, you are not meant to kind of read individual, individual lines here, but these are, um, uh, these are uh, concepts uh, for May 2020 
uh, which are um, most significant in comparison to uh, nine previous years of my, my uh, diaries, but presented through those columns, not through those kind of tile view that I presented you before. What I'm bringing it here is that um, uh, each of the color here shows a part of speech. So here at level zero, we see adverbs, adjectives, um, one to three, those kind of three levels, these are verbs. The level means that there's a subset. So level three is a subset of level two and a subset of level one. So just like with our um, uh, example of parent, uh, parent, relative, father, okay? You've got different conceptual levels. And then uh, level four to 15 um, are mostly nouns. And um, at the very top of those columns, you see a darker shading of the color, which shows you the, the, the amount of concepts in different parts of speech that are very unusual as, that are very characteristic of May 2020 and very unusual in any of the other years. Okay, let me compare this now to pre-COVID thinking, okay? Look at the verbs. Pre-COVID, there are hardly, so hardly any things that we've been doing pre-COVID that we were doing during COVID, but there are a lot of new things that we were doing during COVID that we were not doing in the nine previous years. And I can see this through the kind of statistical um, um, uh, analysis of uh, significance, okay? So you've got a lot of dark colors here. So there are new actions that we've been taking during COVID that we never had to take in the previous nine years, okay? Um, new nouns, here, new things that we had during COVID that we didn't have in the previous nine years, okay? So even before we go into individual sentence reading, individual examples, we can have this very much distant view of the data and see if there are changes in conceptual structure as represented through linguistic structure here, through nouns, verbs, and adjectives. Let me just show you some of the things that we used to do before and we didn't do during COVID. So look, this is for instance, pre-COVID thinking. So the verbs that are most frequent are verbs such as survey, please, uh, fold, pay, usher, um, spoon and heel, disembark. These are the kind of things we did bef before COVID. Uh, they're not particularly um, um, significant because we also were doing them to before COVID, but you see these were the kind of pre-COVID pre-COVID actions, if we look at the COVID actions that we didn't do before COVID, we suddenly have things like distance, out distance, Zoom, lock, furlough, sanitize, mismanage, deploy, sequester. And it, what I'm showing you here is a kind of computational way of reading large amounts of data because those two slides, um, this one slide, presents nearly 10 million, uh, 10 million words of data across 10 years of mass observation archive. And, um, um, and kind of we can read the uh, identify significant concept just by just having a kind of one sensible visualization like this one. And because we have lived for the COVID, we can confirm that the outcomes of the analysis are, are correct. We, uh, like uh, Jessica said, that she didn't use work furlough before COVID. So furlough comes here as one of the significant um, concepts, verbal concepts. Imagine that we use the data, this technique for let's say data that we are not coming from, from times that we are not familiar with. Let's take deeply historical data or data that is from culturally different area. Uh, we can get a quick reading, quick fingerprint of the data using that particular method. Okay, maybe that's enough for the for the distance reading. Let's go a bit more closely. Okay, so this distant data allows us to find out what are the significant concepts. 
And then I can find out how those concepts are lexicalized. One of the uh, significant concepts is concept remotely. This was one of the uh, most frequent adverbs, um, both significant adverbs in as characteristic of COVID, adverb remotely. And remotely has got two meanings. Either, um, oh, I'm remotely interested in someone. So that's that kind of metaphorical meaning or working remotely. So I'm interested in this working remotely meaning, which is represented here by this number zero one. Um, that's what, uh, um, what those numbers indicate. So once I know that remotely is one of those uh, really characteristic concepts of COVID, I can go to a traditional corpus analysis, uh, which is a linguistic analysis of looking at patterns of how language behaves and explore it further. So um, I looked at adverb remotely and I wanted to find out during COVID times, what the, what are the verbs that the adverb describes? Because I know that as a linguist that verbs are described by adverbs, so I knew what to look for. And I found out that the verbs that remotely described during COVID are those one here on the slide, but the one that was most frequently used was work remotely. And here I can go into closer and closer reading to find out what was there going on with working remotely. So when I was picking up individual sentences now for working remotely, individual examples, I started noticing that people, whenever they were talking about working remotely, they, in most cases, were also talking about space and often appropriating space for the remote work. Like in the first example, um, they say, most of the online activities I could cast from my phone to the TV or could be done on my phone, which was vital. And then using my home laptop to work remotely. So there is something about phone and the TV. Then the second person talks about that uh, somebody works remotely in the dining room. By the way, the X's um, are the names that we anonymized. Um, then another person says, my parents could never have imagined that the oak and ash kitchen table that they bought so proudly for five shillings in 1948 would turn into the hot desk for the granddaughter working remotely and two great grandchildren on coronavirus school suspension. So again, we have working remotely and appropriation of a space here, ash kitchen table, oak and ash kitchen table. Then another example, the children and I in the living room and the ex excess uh, uh, working remotely uh, in the dining time, et cetera, talking about meals, but again, leaving room. I'm, I'm focusing in this analysis on space. Um, any other examples? Uh, working remotely from home, um, work PC is on the old computer desk. So giving me two feet, two foot space to work in. And the final one, um, sit at the desk, the right size for me, I'm very petite, et cetera. So there is a lot of, suddenly I see that the concept of remote work somehow uh, correlated with the concept of space and appropriating space. And then when I was reading those examples even further, uh, when I was looking at space and the, 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 the wider context of the work remotely, People were talking about specific ways they appropriated the space, such as I started using an ironing board as a desk so that I could stand up, okay? Um, uh, I should be getting a breakfast bar delivered tomorrow to replace my increasingly wobbly ironing board setup. And again, there is another person talking about ironing board for using it as a game a place, using it for cat sitting, and also for using it as a bedside table. So we have really intimate view of people's bedrooms and, and uh, working spaces and living spaces during COVID times. Um, and I only got this uh, through th to this analysis through starting the kind of bird's eye view of the data, distant reading from the data, and it directed me to here, to very kind of um, focused, um, a fine-grained reading of the data and employing 
the knowledge of um, of discourse analysis and narrative analysis. So just to uh, kind of sum up um, uh, this stage of, of my presentation, um, um, I've shown you how the data can be read in a in a very much bottom-up manner um, uh, in a distant way to extract the key themes and concepts uh, that might, might be not intuitive, and then how this distant reading directs our narrative analysis uh, that can be uh, then through the discourse or other kind of views. Uh, just very quickly, I wanted to show you some of the visualizations that we also developed in order to read the data uh, um, through distant reading, but through visualizations. From simple visualizations like this one, which shows uh, patients of writers of those diaries, uh, or the gender and date of birth, visualizations that also bring us to understanding um, uh, um, the, the, the content or the concept of writing during COVID. So for instance, this, this visualization shows us how much words during COVID people in different, born in different decades used. And while on its own, it's not perhaps that interesting. If you compare it to uh, diaries from other times, you might see, um, um, you might see interesting patterns. So for instance, if I have a lot to say about something, I'm likely to write a lot about it. So if there is a particular group that talks a lot about, let's say, the May the 12th or any other directives that mass observation um, collects during COVID, maybe there, is, maybe there is a reason to explore that group. So there's another angle to find out which text you want to, uh, you want to explore. And it's not through language, but it is through amount of words and date of birth. Uh, another way of exploring the data would be through geographical region. We also experimented with some visualizations of the um, of uh, um, regions um, um, identified the out code rather than the full post code of uh, participants. Um, we also uh, here look at a kind of gender classification. This is middle class female social class classification. We also derive that on the basis of op occupational information. And for instance, visualizations like that can again give you access to how to be uh, formulating hypotheses such as why there is so much uh, talking about delivery in particular part of England or uh, uh, among particular demographics. So that's another distant way of reading data, but that's a way where metadata comes in as well. So the age, gender, class, um, and other things. So I'm just kind of summarizing um, the presentation now, just saying today I've shown you different ways of reading the data. I focus a lot on the distant reading of the data, but I wanted to show you the, the how to read the data when you don't know what to look for, um, like COVID collection, um, where we had to find out new ways of talking about stuff. We don't know what that what's new, what is the kind of post-COVID in a way hangover, or what, what are the words that we uh, uh, or patterns of thinking that we've kind of adopted and will stay with us. So, so um, we very much need the bottom-up approaches to, to be locating this information. And I've shown you how we used um, some of the techniques uh, so far. And, and there are a few things that we are working on. We're working more on visualizations. We're working on um, identifying clusters of concepts rather than individual concepts. Um, uh, and I wanted to highlight that this is kind of this kind of reading of the data is iterative process going through the through the distant reading, coming to the text, looking at examples. Sometimes AI is is mistaken. So, for instance, um, 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 you know there are certain names of the politicians that were uh, uh, that were. Um, coded through our software, uh, through worded software as individual items like real nouns rather than uh, com uh, proper nouns. So there are certain things where you need to be uh, certain. There are many reasons why you need to do the iterative process. Um, but I want to co co conclude properly now with showing that there is a huge value of this COVID collection 
for exploration of ways of thinking uh, and memory and uh, really learning from it. Uh, because it's a longitudinal project, we have data before COVID, during COVID, and now hopefully we are well after COVID. We can really uh, explore this collection to find out answers to a lot of questions, but also find perhaps some kind of uh, um, a mechanism to defend us in the future if any of the crisis of this caliber comes in. And I want to close with the uh, quotation from Jordan Peterson, Canadian uh, psych psycho psychologist, psychotherapist, who keeps saying, people think that the purpose of memory is to remember the past, and that's not the purpose of memory. The purpose of memory is to extract out of the past lessons to structure the future. And I hope that we can use the memory of our mass observation uh, diaries to help us um, um, scientists to really extract lessons to structure the future. Thank you very much.